I wanted to just start with a little piece of wisdom that I just found in my stuff a couple nights ago. This is a postcard that my dad sent me uh, when I was a freshman at UCLA. It's, you know, addressed to me at Sproul Dorm for anyone who went to UCLA. Um, and on the front, of course, as has been talked about, is one of his faves, Jack Kerouac. And on the back, he has a Jack Kerouac quote here. He's written out. Who knows by God, but that the universe is not one vast sea of compassion, actually, the veritable holy honey beneath, beneath all this show of personality and cruelty. My dear daughter, we must learn to love the world in spite of the world. It is our most important lesson and our only salvation. Much, much love, Dad. P.S. Don't forget to schedule your dental cleaning next month. They book up very far in advance. So there it is. That's pretty much, pretty much it. Um, but yes, I, over the years, on occasion, I have gotten asked, you know, what was it like to grow up with this Dharma trickster as my dad? And, you know, it's kind of hard to gauge as it is for all of us. You kind of know what you know. But there's a few things that maybe stand out as kind of unique. Um, as I was growing up, not only did my dad help me develop my sense of self, he helped me develop my sense of no self. <laughs> but um, bum. All right, a little homage to the West Nisker Borscht Belt Dharma humor. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, to his credit, he never pushed mindfulness or meditation onto me, which is probably why I was somewhat interested in it growing up. Um, and, you know, the way he was expressing it with humor and songs, even as a kid, it was pretty compelling. So, in fact, my dad still has a postcard from me that I sent him when I was eight years old. I had just visited Borbador, the incredible ninth century Buddhist monument in Java, with my mom, Mudita, I get it from both sides, obviously. Um, most of you know that. Uh, and on the front of the postcard is a picture of Borbador. And on the back, in my scraggly kid handwriting, it says, Dear Daddy, I know what I want to be when I grow up. And then in giant letters, Buddha. <laughs> so you can imagine how delighted he was to get that postcard. Um, I do think it was kind of the height of my spiritual aspirations. And the next month I was on to wanting to be an architect and then a pop star. And, um, but he was so supportive of all of my endeavors, a lot of wacky endeavors. Uh, I did notice, though, a little more enthusiasm around anything that involved poetry or subversive political action. <laughs> so those were the, those were the values. Um, but the threads of the Dharma continued along, and when I was 13 years old, I completed the rite of passage of our people, the Buish people, the Jubus. And instead of having a bat mitzvah, I went out to Green Gulch for two weeks of Zen practice. <laughs> um, and looking back, you know, I don't really know what my <laughs> preteen self was thinking. On the one hand, you have something that culminates in a giant party with all your friends and lots of presents. And on the other hand, you have waking up at 4 a.m. for Zen monasticism. <laughs> and also at that point, you know, you really want to try and fit in, and that did not help my cause <laughs> for doing that. Um, but as I was thinking about waking up at 4 a.m., I did something else, you know, the, radio, the whole radio thing is also such a huge thing. And I think the only other times in my life that I uh, woke up at 4 a.m. was when I was a kid for a very special treat. Sometimes I would get up with my dad super early and we'd drive across the Bay Bridge before it was light outside and go to KFOG for the morning show. And that was always very exciting. Um, our little ritual afterwards would be, we'd go get dim sum and then we'd go to North Beach and have a coffee at Cafe Trieste. Well, he would have coffee and I would have steamed milk. And then we would go across the street to City Lights um, bookstore. So. Even as a seven-year-old, I kind of knew that was all freaking cool. <laughs> so, um, but back to the kind of Dharma trickster aspect. Uh, 
Another wonderful thing has been sharing retreat time with my dad. And I think one of the first retreats we sat together, it was here at Spirit Rock. Uh, and before the retreat started, we were down at the Gratitude Hut and looking at the pictures of the different teachers. And we got to Buddha Dasa, and my dad was telling me about when he went to see him and you know how enthralled he was by what Buddha Dasa was saying. And of course, it's very hot and sticky in Thailand. So every few words, when Buddha Dasa would gesture or move his arm, there'd be this loud, like suction sound. <laughs> so we had a little laugh about that. And then later, um, during the retreat, I was having a particularly kind of fraught sitting period, and I opened my eyes for a little while, and I saw something like moving out of the corner of my eye, and I looked across, you know, the sea of everyone meditating, and my dad was miming the <laughs> suction sound <laughs> with his arm, <laughs> and of course I, you know, broke out into laughter and had to leave the hall, but it really did like reset my whole retreat for me, so it really shook me out of things. That's the trickster in action there. Um, and then I have had the chance on a few occasions to sit a retreat where my dad was the teacher. Uh, and one in particular that I uh, remembered was, it was over the Halloween, Day of the Dead type period of time. So we're doing a lot of death and dying rituals. And uh, of course, there's my dad, so a lot of haiku. And he was on one of the last nights of the retreat, he was uh, giving the Dharma talk and it was on impermanence. Uh, and I just remember him there in his chair with his shawl and his furry head. Um, and then, you know, we all sat there with our eyes closed for a little bit. And I happened to open my eyes a little early. I guess my dad had had to cut out early that night. And it was just so striking because I opened my eyes and there was just his empty chair and his shawl there. And it was just such a tender moment of feeling that impermanence. Um, and also just feeling so held by his expression of wisdom and love in this world. And I think not just for me as his daughter, but for so many of us, I think there's just this special little place in our hearts where the West wisdom lives, where something inside of us he's inspired. And, and I say that as well because growing up in the Bay Area for my entire life, really, if I meet someone at a party or just in passing at the grocery store, if they find out I'm Scoop Nisker's daughter or Wes Nisker's daughter, whether they know him from radio or from teaching, they get this little twinkle in their eye. They get this like special, unique little twinkle. And it really feels like they're kind of radiating out that part of themselves in that twinkle. And it almost sometimes feels like they're reflecting my dad out <laughs> at me <laughs> through that twinkle. So, ah, so here is to the West Scoop Nisker twinkle in all of us <laughs> that we can all carry within us. I love you so much, Daddy. I know Joseph has not convinced you <laughs> the truth of rebirth, but I'm sure I did something extraordinary in a past incarnation to end up with you as my dad. So, um, yeah, so... And now we have a break, so you can take your West twinkle and go tinkle. <laughs> it was all leading up to that. <laughs> but come back for more. We have Nina Weiss performing.